Hello and welcome. Today on the center of it all, we look at the history of a local town through the eyes of a muralist. We see where Penn State's turf science program has taken a few of its alum, and Mel cooks up a classical French blueberry galette in Kitchen Encounters. These stories and more coming up next on the center of it all. Hello and good day. Thanks for joining us on the center of it all. I'm your host, Alex Rabb. We have a jam-packed show for the day, so let's get started. We take a trip to visit the town square of Lewistown. A local muralist painted an amazing piece of art to help commemorate a part of history of the town. If you look around, you can find art anywhere. That's the case for Lewistown. When driving through the town square, there are two murals on either side of you. So why are there murals within walking distance of each other and a third at Victory Park? It happened to be that a muralist, Dwight Kirkland, wanted to give something back to the town. And then after talking to the local people around here, I ran into the mayor who is involved with the Embassy Theater, which is behind us. And uh, from there, it evolved into the history of all the theaters here in Lewistown, um, which there happened to be quite a few of them, five of them. So uh, we broke that all down and found all the interesting people in Lewistown that had something to do with, with the theater. So that's, that's where this started. Mayor Deb Bargo is a Lewistown native. She feels this mural is important on many levels. It's so important, sometimes we don't realize how we need to embrace the, our heritage, you know. It, and the Juniata Valley is filled with history. And lots of times, you know, the children are not taught the importance uh, of knowing, you know, what has happened before. And it's really our, our responsibility to preserve this and to, to pass it on to, our, to generations. The mural shows three of the five theaters of Lewistown, with the Embassy Theater being the center. It holds a lot of history and is Mifflin County's last remaining traditional movie house. Originating in 1927 and closing its doors in 1989, the theater reminds those of the history of the town. It's slowly being restored with plans to become a community arts center for the area. With the historic marquee, the front facade, and the historic box office all restored, the inside is what remains to be rebuilt. Now, the Embassy Theater is trying to raise money to match a grant. And my idea was that if we could raise enough money through this mural, which I donated my labor and time on, uh, that we could help them with their grant money. So looking at the mural from right to left, Kirkland explains the people depicted were the ones that added a little flavor, so to speak, to the town back in the day. I mean, you have Doc Eby up here, uh, who was the town greeter for Lewistown. He, uh, I like to meet all the celebrities when they came into town. And then you have Gene Ackers behind me who was uh, married to Rudolph Valentino for a record six hours. Uh, still holds a record in Hollywood. Uh, you have the original uh, ushers from the Embassy Theater. And then you have Bob Hambright who is a main fixture in a lot of these theaters, especially the Embassy and the Miller. Um, and then after that, you have uh, Roy Rogers and Trigger, which they visited here, I think it was 1937, uh, was, was when they came into town. And a lot of the celebrities back then, Gene Autry and all of them, would, would tour through the town. So uh, that was part of the history here. Kirkland has painted murals all over the world. So one may ask, why would he choose to give his valued time to this cause in Lewistown? After living in a big city, and you're, you're such a small fish in a big pond, that being here, kind of changed my perspective. It allowed me to do something that people would recognize and I could give back to a community. And this is a nice place. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's small town America and it's really nice to live here after you've been in such big cities. The murals in the town bring culture to the area and the mayor hopes it promotes something else. The mural uh, as a whole, uh, since we are so fortunate to have Dwight uh, Kirkland in the area and he's so very eager to, to do these murals that we're hoping that we'll have a series of them and that it'll promote tourism in our area to come and see this. So what's the town's reaction to it? I think everybody loves it, you know, I mean being out here for two weeks painting it, everybody was really happy to see it. They, they think it's a great improvement 
and they wanted to have pictures taken and you know I think it's exciting and fun and it's it's a it's a facelift for the for the town. So next time you're hankering for some history, stop by Lewistown. Check out the murals, the historical buildings, and the ambiance. It's a look into the past with the hopes of paying it forward into the future. You can check out more art from Dwight Kirkland at blackleafstudio.com. Don't go anywhere. We have to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll get to talk to a local who became roped up with the National High School Rodeo Association. Welcome back to the center of it all. It's pretty amazing what kids can do when they put their minds to it. Our John Stroh met up with a high schooler who can do some pretty impressive things with a lasso. Central Pennsylvania certainly had its share of great athletes. John and Nate Stupar have both succeeded in the NFL and Matt Adams with the St. Louis Cardinals. And Quentin Wright is a two-time NCAA wrestling national champion. And the next great athlete may just come in the sport of rodeo. That's right, I said rodeo. Coy Lutz just finished his sophomore year at Bald Eagle area by finishing 17th in the country in bareback riding at the National High School Rodeo Championships. And Lutz talked about his performance. Yeah, I was sitting 10th going into the short go, and uh, I got on a horse of Frontiers, and it didn't really work out that well. I fell off, ended up 17th. As you can imagine, it was disappointing for Lutz to slip from 10th to 17th. Yeah, I would have been sitting good if I would have finished, finished that horse off, but... I didn't really finish her off very well and came off. Nothing worthwhile comes easy, and Lutz has certainly dealt with his share of adversity. In 2012, at the NHSRA Championships, he had his jaw broken early in the competition. And Lutz talked about pushing through the tough times. Go back home and practice, stay positive, practice, work out, and then get back on. And with those tough times hopefully behind him, Lutz feels that with a little more hard work, he can definitely bring home a top 10 finish next year. Hoping to get a little better, <laughs> practice a bunch, go on a bunch more. Once I'm riding a little better, I should compete, hopefully compete a lot better. And you just gotta draw good and get on good horses and ride good, and then everything else will fall in place. Lutz's father, Doug, is a former professional bullfighter. So for Coy, bareback riding isn't a far stretch at all. My dad used to fight bulls and ride bareback horses, and I used to go to a bunch of bull ridings with him. I wanted to be a bull rider to start out with, but he didn't want me to do that because he didn't know anything about it. So he started getting me on bareback horses, and I like that even more now. So, Lutz's coach, Tyler Waltz, an accomplished bareback rider at the collegiate level, tells us what makes Coy so good. Coy's just got a lot of natural talent, and he's got a lot of try. And I think try is something you can't teach a kid. They just got to have it in them themselves. And he's the type of kid that always wants to learn, always wants to improve. And I think that's what separates him from the rest of the kids. And Waltz has some very high expectations for his star pupil. I think. He's going to go farther than he can imagine. He's going to have a lot of coaches looking at him to go to school. And uh, I look for him to win a world championship someday. He's got a lot of trying. He's got a lot of natural ability. I look for him to go very far. Maybe one day we'll turn on the TV set and see Coy Lutz riding on a professional rodeo tour. For the center of it all, I'm John Stroh. Thanks, John. So our Andrew Callista loves Penn State and loves golf. He was very excited to learn that this year, Penn State Turf Science graduates shined on at the major PGA events. You may or may not know about the turf management program here at Penn State, but you should. It just may be the most successful program the university has to offer. So let's find out what makes the program so special. Professor of Soil Science and Turf Grass, Andy McNitt, oversees the four-year program. He attributes much of the success to the great alumni network that Penn State has established. Well, that's one of the greatest things. We do have a, a, a huge network, and we, we coach the students on that. I mean, there's several things that'll get a student a job in the turf industry. One is certainly where they get their degree and how well they do in school. But secondly is their experience, and we start building a network. Uh, first, their, their fellow students are their beginning network, and then their professors, and then every time they go out on an internship, they continue to build a, a large network, and certainly Penn State has one of the largest networks uh, in the world as far as Penn State, as far as turf grass students go. To have a network that large, a seed has to be planted somewhere along the line. And for Penn State, that seed was planted a long time ago at one of America's premier golf courses. Penn State's one of the oldest and certainly the largest uh, educational turf program in the United States. It started in 1929. Interestingly enough, it was started by uh, uh, we call this the Joseph Valentine Turfgrass Research Center because uh, Joseph Valentine, who was the longtime superintendent at Marion Country Club, came up to talk to President Hetzel 
and convinced him to start a uh, turf grass program here at Penn State. With the help of uh, some of the members at Marion, the uh, state legislature uh, committed $10,000 in 1929 to start our turf grass program. Then in 1955, Penn State became the first institution to offer formal education to golf course superintendents. The rest is pretty much history, as Penn State has become a leader in the turf management world. We have a great relationship with the industry. Uh, the industry does fundraising for us uh, to help us do research to help them solve problems. So we, not only do we help them solve technical problems, but we also offer them human resources and human capital. Uh, they, they help train our students through internships and we help supply those, uh, those golf courses and athletic field managers with qualified students and, and employees after they graduate. Maintaining that seller reputation in the industry requires some serious facilities. It's no surprise that Penn State's are some of the best and most versatile. Well, we're standing on the Joseph Valentine Research Center, which is uh, 27 acres. Uh, this is where we do the high-end turf grass management, like golf greens, fairways, high-end football fields. We also have the Landscape Management Research Center. At the Landscape Management Research Center is uh, where we do sort of lower maintenance turf. We also do environmental impact there with uh, things like pesticide and fertilizer runoff and leaching through the soils. And we also uh, work with PennDOT there and have a program where we look at roadside turf. When you have alumni superintendents host the Masters, U.S. Open, and PGA Championship, you're bound to receive some accolades. But Penn State has plenty of success when it comes to athletic fields as well. We were fortunate to, uh, to have a Penn State alumni, Bill Deacon, host the uh, Major League Baseball All-Star Game at City Field for the Mets. Currently, we have five head groundskeepers in the NFL and many, many assistants uh, and similar kind of numbers in, in Major League Baseball and certainly in, in golf. Uh, we have a long established record of, of having uh, many superintendents across the country. If Penn State wants to continue to be a trailblazer, it will have to find a way to get students to the classroom. Not a problem here in Happy Valley, as they are already looking towards the future. The world has changed. People are out working, they're coming back to school as a, as a returning adult. Maybe they've got a, a, uh, a, a basic degree from somewhere else. And so what we're trying to do is offer them essentially a smorgasbord of opportunities. We have um, three certificate programs, two online, a basic certificate and an advanced certificate that you can get completely online. We also have our resident two-year golf turf management program, which is the sort of the gold standard. It was the one that got Penn State started in 1955. We also then have a two-year associate degree. We have a four-year degree, both of which you can get residently or online. And we even have a master's of professional studies that you can get online. That's as great a story as there is right now. 100% job placement and three different options for coursework. Can it get any better for a student? For the center of it all, I'm Andrew Callista. Thank you, Andrew. Stick around. When we return from our break, we stop by the Prosciutti residence to see what Mel's up to in our newest kitchen encounters. Thanks for joining the center of it all. On today's kitchen encounters, Mel Prosciutti heads to the garden to gather a few blueberries. She shows us how to make a tasty blueberry galette perfect for the summer months. It's the height of the berry season here in Happy Valley, and my own garden has buried me with berries this year. Cherries, strawberries, and now blueberries. As much as I like to bake pie and make pie crusts, I'm here to tell you I don't always have the time or the energy. Today, I'm going to show you how to put pie on your family's dessert table in half the time with half the mess and half the fuss. Let's get started. I'm going to show you how to make my recipe for rustic berry galettes. And galette is just a fancy word for a rustic berry tart. And I'm starting today with six cups of fresh blueberries. You can use almost any kind of fruit. You can use apples or cherries or even peaches as long as you have six cups. To the berries, I'm going to add one cup of granulated white sugar and some tapioca, cornstarch, cinnamon, and salt. Get that off my hands. I'm going to mix all of these dry ingredients just long enough to get the berries a good coat. And for my wet ingredients, my secret ingredient, 
is a little bit of a blueberry blast schnapps, about three tablespoons. And one tablespoon of lemon juice. And I'm using concentrate. This is supposed to be an easy recipe. I'm gonna mix all of this together until the wet ingredients, until the blueberries actually all kind of start to look blue again instead of white. And now, I'm just gonna set this aside for about five minutes to let the cornstarch and the tapioca work its magic and thicken this into a really nice pie filling. Well, my berries are thickened, and while they were thickening, I took a baking pan and I lined it with aluminum foil and a sheet of parchment paper. And I took two boxed pie crusts, yes folks, boxed pie crusts, out of the refrigerator to come to room temperature. I've rolled one here out on the pan, and I'm just gonna roll the second one out. And these are actually gonna overlap each other, but you'll see how this works when it goes together. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sprinkle the bottom of each one of these with just a little bit of tapioca. Oh, maybe half a teaspoon to a teaspoon. And I'm gonna leave a border of unfilled uh, pie filling and in the whole layering process, you wanna leave a border of about an inch to an inch and a half around the bottom of each pie crust. So now it's time to scoop in our filling. I'm using a slotted spoon and working as quickly as I can and as evenly as I can without, this is supposed to be easy and fun, I'm just going to add my berries to the top of both pastry crusts. Do you see how nice and thick this got? And if it drips, don't worry about it. Nobody's going to see it. Okay, the berries are in. Now all I'm going to do, I'm going to fold these pastry crusts just like you'd be folding fabric. Up and around, up and around, up and around. Isn't this easy? This is fun. Even your kids would have fun doing this. You're just making a little pouch. That's called a galette. You're encasing the berries with your pie pastry. No drips, no mess. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna brush the tops of the pastry with the egg wash, which is one beaten egg and about a teaspoon of uh, just plain water. And just brush it liberally. If it drips onto the parchment paper, do not worry about it. The fun part about this is when they come out of the oven, even if the berry filling runs a little bit, the parchment paper gets all the mess, you don't. Okay, we're almost done with this. The next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sprinkle these with cinnamon sugar, the same stuff we used to put on our toast for breakfast. And I'm gonna sprinkle a little extra right on top of the berries as well. I'm gonna pat a little bit of butter. And I like to use salted butter when I put butter pats on. I know unsalted butter is traditional, but I kinda like that little bit of a salty taste which brings up the flavors of the berries as they bake. Just a little bit more. Got you. And now, I'm gonna put these in the oven at 450 degrees for 15 minutes, and then I'm gonna lower the temperature to 350 degrees for 15 minutes. And when these come out, dessert will be ready to be served. What's not to love about this meal for a hot summer day? Burgers on the grill, a little bit of macaroni salad, a warm berry dessert in half the time it takes to bake a pie. Oh wow, that is very delicious. For these and all of my recipes, just go to my website.
If you decide to give this recipe a shot, let us know how it turns out. Post pictures with comments on our Facebook or Twitter accounts. We have to take another quick break, so don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the center of it all. I'm Alex Rabb. We'll wrap things up today by wetting our whistle. I stopped by Marzoni's Brick Oven and Brewing Company in Duncansville to see exactly what they're brewing up. Supporting local may seem to be a rising trend right now, but for Marzoni's, a small brick oven and brewing company in Blair County, the continuous support from the community is what helped get them started and keeps them growing. Bill Croft, head brewer at Marzoni's, joined the team at the beginning. He sees what local support can do for a company. I think we're like on our 10th year of growth. So from where we started to kind of where we are now, every year we've been a little busier. I think people do like supporting local establishments, you know, hopefully like drinking local beer. I think as long as we have a quality product, which you know, I think we do. The beer and atmosphere bring people of all ages into the restaurant. The family-friendly environment keeps them coming back. You know, we want people to come in, be able to relax, have conversations with their friends, enjoy some good beers, and have a good time. And who wouldn't be able to have a nice relaxing time at Marzoni's with six beers on tap and two seasonal? all brewed in-house. We do six year-round offerings. Uh, we have our Lock Mountain Lager, which is our lightest offering. It's sort of like a light-bodied Pilsner-style beer. Uh, um, we have our Marzoni's Amber Lager. Um, we do our Highway 22 Wheat Beer, uh, American-style wheat beer. We have our Patchway Pale Ale, uh, American-style pale ale. Uh, that's, you know, we're starting to get into the hoppy beers now. So we also have our Avalanche IPA. And lastly, uh, for our regular beers, we have our Stone Mason Stout. And then we also always have two rotating seasonal taps. So uh, we do a pretty broad spectrum of beers. I think we've done over like 45 different styles in the 10 years we've been open. So next time you're hungry, thirsty, and around Duncansville, give Marzoni's a try. Not only will they appreciate the support, but your taste buds will also appreciate the experience. It's such a great thing to support the community around you. Well, that's it. I hope you enjoyed the show. Remember to follow, like, or subscribe to us on our social media outlets before you head out to enjoy the rest of your day. Now have a good one.